Lecture 16, Luke 18, 18 through 30, the intent of the gospel. Luke 18, 18, Luke 18, verses 18 through 30. We'll do it again like we did last week, Pastor Temple. I'm going to read half of it, ESV, and I'll let you take the pretty half in uh, King James. Because again, like I always say, there's not a Bible in the world that sounds better than King James. Amen. Amen. It's such a beautiful sounding Bible. Um, Luke 18, verses 18 through 30. I'm going to read verses 18 through 26. Pastor Temple is going to pick up verses 27 through 30. Although those are shorter verses, there's power in those verses, and I want that power to be read in King James. So I'm going to read 18 through, 20, uh, through 26. Pastor Temple will read 27 through 30 in King James, and I'll read the, the previous in English Standard Version. I'm going to read slowly um, because there's, we've got a lot to talk about. Amen. And the ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth? To enter the kingdom of heaven, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? He said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now, we've got a lot to talk about here. Yes. Lord have mercy. So, um, here's, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to, so we're still in the what if, and, and, and I'm going to tell you what we've been doing. Just, you already know, but it's just to, to, uh, uh, prick our brains back into what we've been talking about, the one subject. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about everything we already know from a traditional perspective. And then we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. Okay. So what we've been doing is we've been answering my, my, my little question, what if, and, and the thesis or the purpose statement behind this particular past, I mean, particular thing that I've been doing for 14 weeks, so this would be the 15 week, is what would be the message, or what is the message of the New Testament if it only contained Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And what I'm attempting to do is for us to learn more about Jesus Christ than what people say about Jesus Christ, and, and which is important. Now, 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 and again, I've said it all 14, 15 weeks, that I am not arguing that people are saying things differently. I'm just simply saying that when we have a difficulty, I would much rather for us to consult Jesus Christ. If he is our model, we should know what he said. That, that just makes sense, right? If we're to be Christ-like, we should run to the Christ. That just makes sense. And so the Christ, the King, Jesus, the anointed one, the, 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 the everlasting, the slain lamb standing, the rose of Sharon, the, the lily in the valley. This, this carpenter who was God himself 
said a whole lot. And it, we differ in theology today because we have Paul's wonderful, solid theology, but we don't really know Christ's theology. And here's a great way for me to explain such a thing. If I were to ask you a question, what does the Bible say about gays? You run to the Old Testament. You run to what Paul says. And, if I say, and, you, and you will be absolutely correct. And none of these would be wrong. But if I ask you what does Jesus Christ say about gays, you would have a much more difficult time answering that question because we don't know what Jesus Christ says because we don't spend enough time in the Gospels as Protestant churches. We, you understand what I'm saying? Like, and the deal is, it, it's, heart, it's, it's heartbreaking for somebody like me. However, I'm not beating anybody up. This is just what we've been discussing. We've been discussing what is Jesus saying and what are the writers saying about Jesus, and, right? And, and, so, and, so, and that's a powerful question because we, every, when I asked you what does, what does the Bible say about gays, everybody had an answer and you had more than one answer and all your answers were correct. But when I asked you what does Jesus say about the same subject, we, we, we have no answer, right? We, you know, it's, it's, here's another example. What is what does Paul say about tithing? We know that. We, 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 we read it every Sunday, right? We know that. What does Jesus say about it? Ah, difficult question because Jesus never really answers the question. Jesus stays silent and then asks a question back <laughs> to the people. Jesus purposely did not answer questions uh, sometimes because he left some opportunity there um, for theology, but we'll, we'll get to that in, in, in a little bit. So basically, that's what we've been doing. Now, this passage, uh, for those of you just walking in, we're reading Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through uh, 27 or something. I forgot what it was. 18 through 30. Excuse me, 18 through 30. It's the passage in which, which we, we've come to a customer called the rich young ruler. Anybody familiar with that? We say that. What that is, is that, that's a lot, of, it's a lot of what we call gospel gumbo. It's mixing all the Gospels into one. So when you read this one, you don't get the, you have no idea that this, this man is young. He's this rich. And he, he's this ruler, right? Jesus says that. In another Gospel, you find out he's a young man, right? And that's where we get rich, young Gospel. So, the, remember, so now I'm moving on to the traditional thing. We also get the fact that he's rich and he has a problem. Does, <laughs> does that make sense? Like, and it's so much of the problem with Jesus Christ says himself, listen, uh, I feel bad for you rich folk because it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich person. Now, now, now let's discuss this because there's been lots of talk about this here. I've heard many of preachers make this a metaphor. I've heard many of preachers, well, it wasn't really eye of the needle or it was, it was a gate. Or, listen, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to argue against any of that. This is a literal thing in which Jesus Christ is talking about. Because <laughs> these, these guys are farmers. They, they, they sow. They're very accustomed to um, what an eye of a needle is. And Jesus is literally trying to make a point. Like as hard as it is for an animal, a camel, to get through an eye of a needle, is as hard as it is for a rich person to get through to the kingdom of heaven. Now, why is Jesus saying this? And now I have to ask an irresponsible question that's a fair question. Does Jesus have a problem with money? Is, right? is, it, is Jesus saying that don't, don't be rich? Is rich a sin? Is it, is it a sin to be rich? Let's see if somebody can answer this question. Is, is it okay to be rich? Because that's all right. Is it? Is it okay? Because it, this passage, yes, it is. it is. It is okay to be rich. It is. It's not a sin to be rich. It's, it's, it's a, now, if you love your richness. Now you become and say amen more than you love God. Right? <clears throat> um, uh, great theologian, Augustine uh, of Augustus, uh, the, the, the 14th or 15th century uh, scholar in which we get most of our, a lot of our great theology from, um, had wrote a book and it's, it's, he talks about disordered love. When your love, you can love, God lets you, here's his argument. God says, you can love whatever you want. It's when this love becomes disordered does it become a sin. So God doesn't mind you loving your house, but when your house is over God, 
now we're sinning. Does that, does that make sense? It kind of simplifies that for a second. And so here we have it in which Jesus, in fact, let's, let's read this passage again because people just walked in. Luke 18, verse 24, and we're about to get very interesting in here. Jesus saying that, and let's go back to 23. But no, let's go back to 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, my man, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now watch the, watch, there's a narrator get ready to talk. And it says, but when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Now the narrator is going to say what Jesus is getting ready to say. In this case, the narrator is Luke. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. It almost seems if if you at the very least, if you if you stop being so spiritual, at the very least, it almost seems like it's a problem being rich. As a matter of fact, we, we've heard over and over and over and over again, this, I'm dealing with all these traditional things right now, before I tell you what I actually want to talk about. Over and over, uh, money is evil, and the truth is, the love of money is evil. There, there is a difference. And, and, and I would like to say, just for free, money doesn't really change who people are. Now, this isn't really part of the, my script or, or the text, but money enhances who you actually are. It doesn't change who you are. It enhances your current character. So if you are already selfish and you, you, but you're a good person, when you get that money, that selfishness is going to be enhanced. Amen. <laughs> so it's not that somebody changed. No, that person was always that way. Now they just got the confidence to act that way. Amen. Because <laughs> money, money will give you confidence. And, and, and here's the deal. And Jesus understands this. And Jesus understands that money actually does Bring happiness. Now, now, now don't, 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 don't let me lose you because I know the joy is from the Lord. I know, I know joy comes from the Lord. But Jesus understands that money leads to prosperity. His great ways for you to understand, understand this here. Jesus spends more time talking about money than he does salvation. Okay, here he's talking about salvation, and we're going to talk about that. But now he's talking about money and salvation. The entire beatitude that you had to remember when you were three years old, and you've been remembered for the next 60, 70 years, or 20, 30 years, they're all about happy. Happy are you if this happens, right? And so Jesus understands that money brings prosperity, but there's a certain point in which that stops. Let me give you a few examples. In Jesus' time, 75% of your income went to bread because you built your own homes. There was no light bills, no cell phone bills, right? There's no, no, there's no air conditioning. You understand what I'm saying? There's, there's no, none of these things happening. And so 75% of the income in the ancient days went to bread. And then the 20 other percent, 25% went to wells. Today, 75% of our income goes to what? Well, what is it? It's rent or mortgage, right? 75% of our income goes directly to whatever financial institution owns our house. And they tell us we own it, right? And so here's the deal. Jesus understands that if you're poor, homeless, and everything, if I give you enough money to meet your needs, like, like just your needs, to put a roof over your head, to put stomach, food in your stomach, and for allow for you to take care of your family, that will bring you happiness. There's no doubt about it. Because I've switched your position from hunger to, to ready, right? This is the same reason Jesus, almost every, especially in the book of Luke, Every single time Jesus does something amazing, he does it over food. Every time in Luke, like seriously, he, he feeds 5,000. At the end, when he's resurrected, the people don't even, the two people that's walking down Damascus Road don't even recognize he's Jesus. He keeps himself hidden until he gets to break bread again. And it's the food, that food moment that opens up the eyes of the people who need to hear it. And now, then salvation comes. And so... Basically, Jesus understands that, yes, 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 money matters. But now we're getting into what I want to talk about, the intent of the gospel. Now, now we're getting there, right? So here's the deal. We've been talking about what's the gospel. What, what would be 
the point of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what's the point of the New Testament if that happened? What is the point? What's the point? What's the point? We've been talking about, I've, week one I say it's the gospel, but it's not. The gospel is not what you think. The gospel has nothing to do with salvation, blah, blah, blah. Now, now, Jesus has been going up and down, up and down, and now Jesus now hits you with the intent. Now, I'm going to reread this passage to you, and I want you to hear now what the intent of the gospel is. Not hearing the man's rich, not hearing that Jesus is correcting him, not the fact that he's a rich young ruler, not the fact that he's, it's hard for wealthy people to get through the eye of a needle. That is the method in which Jesus is, is delivering his message, with his words, through these supporting details, but that is not the intent of what Jesus Christ is saying. Let me repeat that again. Jesus Christ is going to say a whole lot of stuff. Luke himself is going to say a whole lot of stuff. Luke is going to identify every major character in this particular pericope or episode, whichever words you choose. Luke is going to identify that it's Jesus, a rich young man, and a crowd that are there listening to what Jesus is saying. But not only that, Jesus is going to recognize that this man is rich and he's going to have a problem and Luke says this man is sad because he did everything right, but Jesus himself said there's one thing you didn't do. Now, 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 I need you to hear this here because Jesus never once said this man was lying. This, like, if, if we're going to be exegetically conservative, right, it means to take out the text. If we're going to be textually conservative, Jesus never disagrees with this man's statement. This man says, yes, sir, I've done all of that, including what Pastor Temple has said before, the one commandment that actually has a condition tied to it, oh, honor your mother and father. If you, if you didn't know, the only of the Ten Commandments of the law that has a condition tied to it is honor your father and mother, f father and mother or your days will be numbered, will be shortened, or whatever translation you have. And so he's like, listen, not only have I did all that, I even did the one that had the condition applied to it. I'm good. And Jesus goes, well, yes, you did. But basically, because when he says, when he literally says, but there's one thing you haven't done, he's also implicitly saying, yes, you did. Let's explain that for a second. If I tell you, sit down, the understood or the implicit subject in the sentence, sit down, is you. Does, does that make sense? Like, so if I... The command sit down has one word or two words, depending on how you write it. But the subject is already implied, implicit, and encapsulated in that, that action verb, that verb. It's you. It's understood. You is a subject. So when Jesus says, but there's one thing you haven't done, what's understood is, yeah, okay, yeah, you, you got that. I won't even address that. Here's the problem. Now let's read what Jesus says. This time, though, Hear the intent. So the stage is Jesus is talking. He's getting ready to correct some folk. Man has done all that he was required by the law to do. And now Jesus comes in and adds extra to it. Watch what he says. Verse 24. Jesus seeing that he had became sad. Remember, I want you to listen to the intent. Jesus seeing that man had became sad. He said, how difficult is it for you to have a camel walk through the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to walk through the richer person, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, oh, sorry, let's, let's go back to 22. 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, it would be unfair to put upon Jesus Christ that he required this young man uh, in this particular text, if we stay true to the text, this rich ruler, because he's not young in this text, this rich ruler, if we, it would be unfair to say Jesus required him to sell all his possessions. Jesus said that, and I can't argue that Jesus, if the man would say, yes, Jesus would say, no, don't do that. That's, that's not in the text, so I won't even argue that. Here's what you need to know for sure. Jesus is talking way more than about money. Amen. Jesus is saying, you have some stuff. But what I came down here for was to make sure everybody has some stuff. Mm. Check this out. 
There's a reason why I stuck a little bit on money bringing happiness and money to a certain point. If I take you from homelessness and give you a place to stay, that will make you happy. Now, if I take you from a place to stay to a billionaire, that, that money doesn't change anything. In fact, more money, more problems, right? It, it's, gonna, it's probably going to get worse. However, if there's a certain condition in which, or there's a certain condition in which your life that if I take you from one place to another and I change completely where you were and set you anew to where you are now, that will bring you some happiness. And Jesus says, you have this happiness, but others do not. So check this out. You're doing good but others do not. And that's not all, and that's not even the main point of what Jesus says. Because if you look at the last thing Jesus says, he says, last two verses, and he said to them, now he's talking to the crowd, right? He rebuked the man. And and not not even like a harsh rebuke, he just told the man some real talk. And And then he says, and he said to them, truly I say to you, there's no one who has left their house or brother's Parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Let's stop right there. Because this is what he asked this man to do. He said, listen, sir, I need for you to give it all up. Share it with everybody. And then the last three words, uh, four words of verse 21, and come follow me. Please don't miss it because while I'm rushing, while, while I'm climbing to this climax, it's also simultaneously Right there at the conclusion. I need you to understand that Jesus says to this man, you've done right and you have. But there's more. Not only is there more, but I now am telling you what you've done right as, what you've done right with, give it to everybody else. But not just that. After you've lost Everything you earned, come follow me. And here's here's the intent of the gospel, and here's the problem with the gospel. Say that different. Here's the intent of the gospel. Here's the human problem with the gospel. Jesus says, you have some stuff. I need for you to lose your life and then come follow me. See, before I got here, Before I changed you, you earned some things. But now that you've met me, now that you're going to be introduced to me, lose your life and come follow me. And this is why many people turn back from the gospel uh, and many people don't even accept the gospel because it's, it's, it's a crazy intent behind the gospel. Last week, we talked about the cost of the gospel. There's a reason why I'm here. Last week, I told you that Jesus Christ said, this here is expensive. And if you're going to follow me, you're going to die following me. Amen. Is that what it, pretty much what I said? I told you last week that the gospel costs a whole lot. Now I'm telling you the intent is tied into the cost, but the reason we run from it It's because we missed the last thing Jesus Christ says. We are introduced in the faith that Jesus says, you're going to follow me. But in order for you to follow me, I need you to lose whatever you think makes you look good. See, see, the man got sad because he, this is the reason why I stayed on happy money. Money does bring you happiness to a certain point because some of you, if you, if your lights get cut off right now, it will alter your mood. Amen. If you if you miss a bill, if your house gets it can't get repossessed, what, what is it? What, what is house get foreclosed? Right? If your house get for it will alter your mood. So there are there's something about money that you're somehow you've tied it into your self worth. Jesus understands it, et cetera, et cetera. He gets that, but then somehow Jesus says, "But give all that up. Give it all up, Deacon Aaron, Rhonda. You can't have it. Just just you want to follow me." Here's what you do. Like, I want, to put you in, I want to put you in the shoes of this young man. There's a reason he grew sad. You know that house you just worked real hard to get? Give it up. But go give it to people who don't even deserve it. Watch it because I'm going somewhere. Who haven't worked hard for it, who probably won't care about it, and who have not earned the right for you to give it to them, but give it to them anyway. 
And then he says, and come follow me. Let me repeat what I just said. He says, Tony, remember that house you just worked real hard for? Yeah, that one that you give it away. Not the mortgage. Give them the house. You still pay for the mortgage. I wish I had somebody. Lord have mercy. Right? <laughs> give them the blessing. You take the burden. I wish I had somebody. Amen. This, I'm trying to put you in this man's shoes because in about, in about four minutes, I'm done. <laughs> right? In about four minutes, I am, I am done with this whole class. Here's the deal. You need to understand that there's a reason why this rich man got sad. Because you want me to get what? You, you want me to hold on. Everything? And what Jesus says, yes. And then after you've lost all that you worked hard for, all that makes you look good, everything everybody compliments you about, everything that makes you happy, everything that makes you comfortable, after you've lost every bit of what is you that you've earned, come follow me. So basically, Jesus is saying, lose everything and get down to a level to where you have nothing. And follow me. <laughs> the intent of the gospel is tied into the cost of the gospel. Because in order to follow Jesus, you got to lose everything. Now, let's go back to verses 29 and 30. Most of us never get this far. Because you just asked us. <laughs> Amen. Hold on, Lord. Now, you want me to do what? Because... Because I can give them my credit card, but they're going to take my bills too. Now, now, now I'm not going to do both. Now, now they're just not going to say, I, work, I just cleaned this carpet too. I'm not fit to sit up here and let them come in here and mess up what they didn't earn. Now, amen. If that, if that ain't none of y'all, y'all ain't never bought nothing before. Amen. Remember when you was a kid, your mama bought you some shoes, you ain't care nothing about them, you bust them all open. But the moment you spent your own money on your shoes, amen, you took real good care of them. Verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> here is the benefit of this intent. Truly I say to you, there's no one who's ever given it all away, right? No one who's ever lost a house to brothers, to parents, to children, to forsake the kingdom of God. Watch it. Who will not receive many things more in this time and in the age to come? <coughs> Jesus is saying two things. Please don't miss this here. Listen, 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 listen. Everybody focus on me. It's one of the most important things that we miss in the Bible. So realize eschatology and future eschatology. That means eschatology now, eschatology to the end things. It's a reward now and a reward then. Jesus says, there has never been anybody that I may give up everything that I have not given them more than they gave up in this time and in the time to come. Jesus, please, 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 please hear me. Please, please, please. Lose your life, and I'll give you the life you've always wanted. Amen. Lose your life, I'll give you the life you couldn't even dream of. Paul echoes that. I could do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Jesus says, the intent of this gospel is you're going to give up everything that makes you look good. But when you do. I'll give you everything you've ever dreamed of and never dreamed of because you decided to, to go through the eye of the needle and follow me broke. And I don't require you to be broke. I require you to be broke in. I don't require you to be broke, but I need to break you so you can follow me. And when I break you, I'll fix you and add everything you've ever wanted. Both in this time and in the time to come. That's the intent of the gospel. So if you've never had another book, Luke, if you, never, if you only read Luke, if, you, if that's the only book you ever read in the Bible, you would be confronted with this part of the gospel you'll be confronted with this part of the Bible. If the Bible only existed, if the New Testament only existed in Luke, it will strongly tell you, lose everything, and the Christ will give you everything more. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for what you've done and who you are, and we appreciate you, that you've allowed us to learn that you don't require us to be broke, 
just broke in. In the mighty name of Jesus.